Okay, welcome back after a brief respite. Um, now it's time for our special guest and to cue up our special guest, I wanna bring Jane Lombardi to the microphone. Jane is the Director of Immigration Justice and Partnerships at the Resurrection Project and um, our fearless leader here in the Illinois Access to Justice uh, Immigration Cohort. So Jane, take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, Tom, and um, thank you to our special guest, Representative Dagmara Avelard. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Representative Dagmara Avelard. Um, sorry, my cat is being very um, loud today. She wants her her pets. Um, so I I have so much admiration and love and respect for Representative Avelard. She's serving her first term as the state representative of Illinois' 85th district and is the first Latina to represent that district. Um, and many of you probably um, already know her. She's been an advocate for immigrant rights for many years, uh, previously working as an organizer and most recently as program director of um, Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. She herself is an immigrant from Ecuador um, and after moving to the U.S., she grew up and has lived in, in Bolingbrook ever since. Um, the song that was playing, Build Me Up Buttercup, it, it's one of my favorite songs. And it just, specifically the line of building me up, it makes me think about our work and how we build each other up, build up our communities. And I think that's something that Rep Avelard really embodies um, and has embodied throughout her career. Uh, we're so proud of, of you, uh, so proud of your journey, and really lucky to have you as one of our legislative champions. Um, and I couldn't have thought of a better person to join the session around engaging candidates, creating movements, and building community power. Um, so thank you again so much for joining us, and we're excited to, to hear from you and hear about your candidate story and your experience so far as a legislator and, and what led you here. Thank you again for joining. Oh my God, thank you, Jane, so much. I'm, I'm really getting goosebumps as you were talking about all of this. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, again, uh, I'm Dagmara Avilar. I am a state representative, but advocate at heart. Um, and that is something that I will not apologize for. And I'll tell you a little bit as to why I always say like I'm an advocate regardless of, of whatever title I hold. Um, so just to, as to what Jane was saying, a lot of the work that I did prior to being uh, a state representative had to, uh, was built around immigration, uh, immigrant services and organizing and building power in immigrant communities, for immigrant communities, by immigrant communities, uh, in, in making sure that we are holding our electeds accountable, no matter whether or not we were registered voters or not. And I think that it's always really important for me to say that. Um, so I, I'd say a little bit about my story and I'll try to keep it to less than 10 minutes because I do wanna have enough time for us to take any questions and have a discussion. Um, but as it was said, I migrated from Ecuador at the age of 12 with my sister and my, and my parents. And you know, a lot of my experience in the US is the experience of somebody who was formerly uh, undocumented for the first 13 years of my life here in the US, living in the suburbs. And I think that that truly shaped who I am now, why I'm so passionate about the issue with regards to immigration, and most importantly, how, um, you know, the way that I was able to use the anger that I had around why our immigration system was broken and why um, I was frustrated about the fact that particularly suburban legislators, congressional legislators were not hearing our plight for uh, immigration reform, for the Dream Act and all these other issues that we organize around, um, truly inspired me to look into organizing, not just as something that was a nice thing to do for our communities, but as something that we must do and that we must live um, um, you know, by. Um, so when I was um, in college, I actually got involved with the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights as an organizer, um, back when I didn't even know what an organizer actually meant. And I think that many of us get into this, this work 
not knowing what organizing means, but knowing that we want to help, right? So I had somebody who came to, to the local church that I used to go to who said, we're looking for young people who want to advocate for the DREAM Act, who want to go to Washington, all expenses paid. And at that time, you know, I, I was telling my sister, I was like, well, we're, we're undocumented, so we definitely can't take a flight, but we could take a 15 hour trip, uh, you know, in a bus down to, to, to Washington. And, you know, the Dream Act is something that it's going to benefit us. And we talked to our parents and, you know, I, I had the, the privilege of having such supportive parents who said, Bayan, you know, go on and, and, and do what you have to do. And I think that truly, um, you know, it allowed me to see that while we were these two young ladies who were, who lived in Bolingbrook, who were one of a few ESL students in the area, it, it made us feel part um, of a bigger group of people, of a bigger coalition, of a bigger system that, you know, that we could look at ourselves and say, you know, you are you are also facing the same issues, you are also facing the same struggles, and now we're gonna fight together, right? So I truly see that as a turning point into, um, you know, my life as just a regular student who was just trying to get by, go to school, go to work, go to school, go to work, and just do the, the you know, what I had to do for my family, and looking into knowing that our self-determination is what was going to allow our families to thrive. Um, so fast forward, um, and I know I know Ed is not here, but fun fact, Ed and I were part of the New Americans Democracy Project um, at ICER back in 2008 um, together. And, you know, one of the things that I remember, uh, you know, our, one of the organizers of the program say is that while you might be undocumented, you actually do have a voice. And you might not be the one voting, but you can actually turn out 10 people to vote. And, and you could actually tell your story and people will move through the story of self, right? And that's a lot of what organizing does, right? It, it activates that anger. It activates like that story of self to know, to know that it's, there's a lot of power to it. There's a lot of power to being vulnerable and there's a lot of power to creating community. Um, so that's how I got involved into civic engagement. Eventually, you know, prior to becoming a legislator for six years, I was uh, the director of programs as well as program coordinator for the New Americans uh, Initiative, not the Democracy Project, the New Americans Initiative. And actually that's how I got to know many of you who are here on, on the Zoom. Um, and I looked at a different way of civic engagement from not just the work on the ground of getting voters out to vote, but instigating legal permanent residents to becoming citizens and to letting them know that their vote also means power. Um, so a lot of the work that I did had to do with regards to making sure that we had uh, a budget that worked for not just all, uh, you know, people who live in Illinois, but that also worked for immigrants, that also worked for Latinos, that also worked for, for communities that have been min minoritized over and over again. And the way that we do that is we invest in programs that allow for people to, um, to be self-sufficient and, and being self-sufficient. And I, and I use self-sufficiency, but, but I, I also am very careful about what self-sufficiency means as well, because it truly does take a community to make sure that we're lifting each other up. So while self-sufficiency is something that we aspire to, you can't really aspire to self-sufficiency without also having a community behind you. Um, and I think that that's a lot of the work that we all do, right? With the programs that we run, the programs that we participate in, many of us have gone through either access to justice, have gone through using services with immigrant uh, family resource program, have become citizens through the New Americans Initiative. And we want other people to continue to do it because I think there's a lot to power and there's a lot to be said about how do we build community through direct service that then engages people into civic engagement through the power of, of, of storytelling. Um, so now let me put my legislative hat on. There's nothing more important when it comes to fighting for a budget than the story of constituents directly impacted by the services that you provide. There's nothing more important than the stories of constituents in specific districts, in all districts for that matter, about the services that you provide. Because it tells, when we say tell a story, you're putting now a face to the numbers, right? So um, 
I, I think that that's what I wanted. I wanted to keep it short, uh, and 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 wanted to end there uh, to say that I'm honored to 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 hold the position that I hold. Um, you know, Jane and I had had this conversation over and over again with regards to like how do we build each other up. I truly do believe that. We have a legislature, uh, and particularly with the Illinois Legislative Latino Caucus, we have uh, legislators that have come on board in the past couple of years who truly believe in bench building and not gatekeeping. What does that actually mean? It builds me, building each other up, right? It means not just walking behind a candidate, but walking alongside the candidate, get them into office, and while in office, still hold them accountable and be able to have real conversations. So I hope that today is a day where we engage in real conversations. So I'm really open to any questions that you may have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Representative Avalar. Um, I, the, one question I have for you is, as a former organizer, now you're a legislator. So before you were trying to influence, you know, the bad legislator or the indifferent legislator to do what you want. Now you're that person. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about how your, your role as an organizer influences you or how does it guide you? Oh, I would say that a thousand percent it influences how I move in the legislature. Um, you know, one of the things that you do as a legislator is, you know, you have your, your set of bills that you want to move, right? The bills that you sponsor. Um, and a lot of the work that you do, for those of you who have, have, who have been in Springfield, I remember when I was an advocate sitting in the chambers and you know the clerk would start talking about resolutions people would debate their, their issues and i remember asking one of my mentors i'm like why are all these legislators not listening to the debate and actually speaking to each other having side conversations etc and i would never and i was never able to actually fully understand that until i was actually on the floor and knew that that was literally the only time that you actually got to negotiate your bills or to talk to people about any questions that they had about your bills. Because one of the things that a good legislator should actually do is work under legislation and run their numbers. When, and when I say run their numbers is get the firm commitment from legislators that they are going to vote yes on their legislation. Because the last thing that you want to do, uh, unless it's strategic, is put something on the board that's going to fail. So um, a prime example of this, um, I think it's, it's the Illinois way forward. Um, so as many of you know, in the last uh, spring, not this spring session, but the one before, um, there was a uh, particular legislation that was led in the house by leader um, Lisa Hernandez, that amongst the, all the things that it was going to do, it was also going to close private, uh, private detention, or actually it was going to close detention centers period in the state of Illinois. And, I remember Leader Hernandez asking me, would you be okay sharing your story? And I said, what do you mean? Um, she's like, would you be okay sharing your story about how, what it's like to be leaving as somebody who's undocumented? Uh, and I'm like, absolutely. Right. I think, you know, in, in the past 20 years, um, you know, I, I've seen the, the movement around immigrant rights going from you don't talk about your immigration status. It's very taboo. You don't say anything to anybody who you don't trust because they could always call immigration on you to a level of empowerment that says I am undocumented. I am unafraid. And you know what, what led to that shift in the narrative truly was community, right? Um, so, so I said yes. I, I'll be more than happy to talk about my story and what it was like to have to live day by day, waking up not knowing if my parents were going to return home. And I kid you not, Tom, I had multiple legislators who either did not vote or voted for this bill, even though they knew that it was going to be detrimental for them for an election year. And they approached me and said, I could not not vote for this. I could not go home knowing that this was something that impacted you. So when we talk about storytelling and putting a name to the, to, to the, to the number, putting a name to the struggle, putting a face to, to, to some of the things that many of our communities uh, face, um, it's very powerful. Amazing story. And it's I would amazing. just say this as a lesson for everyone else on this call, you could be in the same situation. And, and, and so the, the thing about what does a leader look like, Representative, is like we're looking at leaders. On this call right now, 
Yeah. These are the leaders we need. And we at the Civic Lab are calling out with the loudest voice possible to all our allies in the nonprofit space to follow your path. So that's what I want to say. Other comments or questions for our special guest? Philip, I think you were going to say something. <laughs> No, I'm shaking my head in agreement. So I'm, what I'm going to say is, please, this is a, an opportunity to talk to someone who's walked the walk and doesn't just talk the talk. And she was literally sitting where you were years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a role for her, for her talents, her story, her perspective was not being in the conversation without her being there. And all of you represent that same uh, possibility and potential. Absolutely. About these so important, crucial issues, and especially when we have such a special guest as Representative Avelar, you know, she's the epitome of what we all fight for, what we all um, look after, and what we all want our community to be. Uh, we know her you know, through her trajectory. And believe me, this is something that is for the history because our community doesn't have access. And that's why we have so many problems. And that's why I say thank you very much because your um, classes and seminars are so enlightening, but especially when we have some somebody like, like Mara, you know, we're very proud of what she is and what she has become and what she's leaving as a legacy for, for the, you know, um, the next generation. I would like to ask the State Representative Dagmara, if you can please explain to us the, in talking about the generational transition, you know, how's the Latino caucus dealing with the progressive, the conservative and the old school so we can really come to an understanding of the real Latino agenda, especially for the advancement of the phantasmas, you know, the spirit, the phantoms, people who are invisible, which is the people that we're fighting for all the undocumented. Thank you, Representative. Netta, that's a great question, because I think if there is one thing that we all learned um, in the in the Illinois Legislative Latino Caucus, so just a little bit of background, right, like the Illinois Le Legislative Latino Caucus, um, it's almost, let's see, it's almost been over 20 years since the, the caucus was, uh, uh, came, came to, to exist. And actually uh, a fun fact that, that people like to tell us over and over again was that back when we had um, Representative Chuy Garcia and I'm sorry, State Senator then Chuy Garcia and also Representative Miguel Del Valle, um, the, 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 the caucus was the, the African-American Latino caucus because we didn't have enough numbers, right? 20, fast forward 20 years now, and you have a Latino caucus that is uh, represented by 15 people who identify as Latino from the Chicagoland area, including Chicago, as well as the color counties. And, you know, now going to ideologies, Right, because I, I think I think I think that's that's what we're 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 trying to talk about right now, right? Like when it comes to ideology, one of the things that we knew as members of the Latino caucus, members that shared wine identity, but who have different political ideologies, we knew that nothing was ever going to be able to get done if we were not together. So we, you know, we have meetings regularly to talk about legislation. And when we talk about legislation, we talk about legislation within the spectrum of like, what happens to Latinos? What are the unintended consequences for Latinos, right? And, and we focus on that because that's what the Latino caucus does. Uh, but then also, where do we show solidarity? And I think that in the past couple of years, what we've seen is that coalition building is what makes our caucus so powerful. The fact that 15 of us 
who you know come from progressive backgrounds, who come from moderate backgrounds, who come from Chicago uh, area, from that come from the color counties, right? Some of us, very few of us, actually represent districts that are not majority Latino, right? So we also come with that background as well, right? So for me, for example, I represent a suburban district. I represent a district that currently at the moment is majority white, but now in the next um, in next year, it's going to, for the first time, be a majority minority district. It's still not Latino majority, right? So, so we're coming with like different we at the end of the day have to look at our districts, right? And see like what's in it for our districts. But then as a Latino caucus, we go into these spaces talking about what are these policies that we're doing? How are they going to affect Latinos? And the more that we are able to be together, um, the more powerful that our caucus becomes. So I think that Netza, I know that that was a really lengthy question. I mean, answer to say that there's power in unity. There's also power in collaborative efforts and also healthy conflict. If there's one thing that I've learned through the years is that the most wonderful thing that you could have in a team is collaborative conflict, conflict that comes out of love, conflict that comes from wanting to see people grow. Uh, and that's what we've been able to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I know it's a, a very complex uh, answer. You know, you can take days to answer that, but. Once I thank you, Dagmara, we love you, we support you, and we're thank with you. you. Thank you. Any other questions? Representative, was something you just said, mm -hmm. um, you were talking about the issues specific to your community mm -hmm. and getting them across in environments or areas where you're not the majority. So how do you get what is seen as an interest or issues that are particular to you and have other people see themselves or the, the benefit to their community or the benefit overall? Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for that question. I think, you know, one of the things that I set out to do when I first decided to run for office, um, or one of the main challenges, I should say, is how do I go from, you know, doing a lot of building within the immigration realm into the mainstream, right? And, and I think it starts with us individually, right, thinking around the fact that while immigration personally is something that's defined me as a person, there's a whole bunch of intersectionalities that we care about, right? Um, I might care about immigration, but I also know that if we don't have affordable health care, you know, that that is a red flag, that if we don't have good jobs, that that is something that we also need to aspire and continue to work on. If we don't have living wages, we know that at the end of the day, who does that affect? Right. Uh, usually, like it tends to be people of color who are low income. Um, so, looking into meeting people where they were at, which required a lot of research. And when I say a lot of research, the research that I embark on is door knocking. Right, and door knocking is the best type of research that you could do. If you want to find out what does that community want you go to the community and you talk to them and you ask them about what are the issues that they care about. Now, I will say, you know, going to somebody to somebody's door unannounced and asking them about like, hey, what are the issues that you care about? You're not gonna get a lot. You're not, you're not going to get a lot, but it is important to continue to build that community to say like, hey, I want to introduce myself. This is what I'm running on. What do you think about this? And having questions that lead to, to, to more conversations, um, it's what allows for, for us to build a platform of the 85th district where you could say like, you know, we want to talk about better jobs. We know through data, right, that people who become U.S. citizens have access to better jobs, right? So that's how I made that connection. When we talk about the, the education to prison pipeline, I also talk about career immigration, right, and the connections between the immigration legal uh, system and the criminal justice system. Um, so I think that for me, what has helped a lot is just looking at those areas where we intersect 
and, and focusing on that, knowing that when it comes to immigration and when it comes to immigrants, we don't just care about immigration. There's a plethora of other issues that we care about too. That was excellent. Awesome. So let me take you back to the moment where you decided to leave organizing and leave the lucrative world of nonprofit administration uh, to become a candidate. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you take us to that moment? I'm sure there was maybe a moment, there were maybe a few moments where you said, okay, my hat is in the ring. That, you know, that's an interesting question because I, you know, the story is a story that's gonna take me maybe like an hour, but I'll make it really quick and I'll do it into a minute. Um, you know, we had our state, our state senator that retired uh, and, you know, organizers and also non-for-profit workers. See, the thing is that a lot of people who work in non-for-profit, and, and please feel free to push back and correct me if I'm wrong, many of us work for non-for-profits and live in the community where we're seeking to do change. Right. So while I was working at the Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, there was also a local organization, the Southwest Suburban Immigrant Project, that was organizing in Bolingbrook. So while I had my head of program director at ICIRR, in my downtime, I would be helping SSIP because helping South Suburban Immigrant Project meant helping my community here in my, in my area. And I was also able to take that knowledge back to this um, statewide organization to say like, hey, the kind of messaging that we're trying to push here in Chicago, it's not going to work in the color counties. And this is, these are the reasons why, right? So long story short, when there was an open seat, and just so you know, open seats don't happen a lot. They, they just don't. So whenever there's an open seat, there's an opportunity for new, for new blood. Um, and <laughs> And the way that, that, that this came about, it was actually, I was organized by community leaders in the area. And I, it truly happened that way because we went from, an, from, a, from a meeting of maybe a dozen of leaders talking about, we need to make sure that we have somebody who has Latino, Latino and immigrant rights issues also at the forefront. Um, how do we make sure that we seek out representation when we are close to 30% of the population here in Will County? Uh, how do we make sure that we get a senator who uh, will have an open ear to our issues and that whenever we request a meeting, we'll be able to sit down with us? That, that is how we came out of that. And we, uh, I'm sorry, that's how we came into this conversation and how we came out of that conversation was we need one of our own. And when we talked about needing one of our own, we literally went across the room and it was, it was, at first it was who is able to run, right? So if you're, if you're undocumented, you can't. If you're documented, you can't. If you're a legal permanent resident, you can't. And a lot of our community leaders uh, who would be amazing people that could run for office, unfortunately can't do it because of their immigration status. So, so, that, so that's one thing that's still in the back of my head as to like when we talk about bench building, what are these other spaces that people can occupy beyond being a legislator? Um, and uh, out of that conversation, um, there was somebody who decided to run for state senator that we supported. Um, so then that meant, and who was our previous state representative, so then that meant that that state representative seat became open. And the only person that actually lived in that area that was able to run was me. And I was very hesitant about it because I love working behind the scenes. I'm a data person. I look at data and then I move into action. I don't like to speak at press conferences. I don't like to be the face of anything because quite honestly, when you build a movement surrounding one person, my opinion is that that's dangerous. Because if you're not in the in a space where you're able to move and you're able to create leaders where you have not, not just one person but dozen people, then that's when you truly create community and community power. Um, so um, I was out organized by our leaders to say that you know you've worked in in, in non for profit, you've worked at the state level, you've secured funding for organizations at the state level, you know a lot of the people there and the relationships that you've built. You are actually the right candidate. Um, and it took a couple of days for me to think about, you know, why me, right? And I think that many of us, unfortunately, fall in this thing of like, we don't necessarily see ourselves, we see ourselves supporting leaders, and we see ourselves supporting candidates, but we don't necessarily see ourselves as the candidates themselves. Oh. I think we need to change that narrative, oh where goodness. we need to start seeing us 
as our leaders, as the person who has that power of that finger that gets to vote yes or no on legislation. Well, again, you made such a statement there that we need to have another flag that I'm gonna put in my living room. We don't see ourselves as leaders, but, but the, the lesson here, if nothing else, is we are the leaders we are looking for. Mm -hmm. Look no further than this call. And part of our job as organizational leaders who have resources behind us is to make these pathways available for our people, including the people on this call. So if you're on this call and you thought, I don't know, I don't look like, I don't feel like a state representative. I don't feel like a mayor. You know what I mean? No. <laughs> You are exactly what we need. And so thank you for lifting that story up. Yeah. And I think I just end up with this. The road to becoming a legislator was not nonlinear. If you would have told me three years ago that this is what I was going to end up doing, I would have said, absolutely not. I'm going to go ahead and finish my master's. And that's what I'm setting out to do. And I'm going to continue to work in nonprofit. I honestly see the work that I do in the legislature as an extension of the work that I was doing, right, which is to seek out power and representation for communities that have been left behind over and over again. Um, so let's let's not stop. Today is just the beginning. Wow. Oh. Jane, do you, do you want to say anything to close out our visit? No, just that. A huge thank you again, Rep. I think your your words are, are always inspiring, and just the your the the way that you share your story um, and the work that you've done. Um, just truly appreciate everything, um, and thank you again for joining us. Absolutely, thank you, thank you very much. This was um, this was very inspiring uh, to me personally, and hopefully to the whole group. As uh, Netza said, you epitomize what we're trying to do. So thank you. I'm really glad. And thank you all for, for providing the space uh, for me and providing the space also for all of, uh, you know, all of you are leaders in your own, uh, of your own, right? And don't let anybody take that away from you. I think, I think that's what I want to leave everybody with. Thank you again, Representative. Have a Thank lot. you, everybody. Have a good day. The 85th District of Illinois. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.